Okay. So that's us. If you want to follow us on Twitter or elsewhere, that's we both have handles. And those are our nicks, et cetera, in case you were wondering. This is the track. So we'll start out with this picture. It um, doesn't blow up as well as I was hoping, but what's wrong with this picture? Any, anybody? Anybody? Anyone? Can you see So this is a meetup I went to. I think it was the um, Twitter World Tour. Can you still hear me? I don't know if they are that. No one came to check the recording. Anyway, whatever. So this is a um, meetup that I went to in Denver. Where I'm from Denver, Colorado. And this was, I think, the um, Twitter world tour, Hello World Tour they've been doing. And it was a really neat meetup. And they gave lots of beer and lots of food and took really good care of us and really great information. And there were some women in the, in the crowd. But it'd be really awesome if 40 to 50% of that room was women, but it was probably the usual 10%. And what we need to do as a community, as a tech world, as a business world, is increase those numbers. So that next year or five years, I go to the same meetup and it's 50-50. And I think that would be more equitable. So why are we here? Um, as Nikki was mentioning, we're gonna provide some actionable items that you can take with you continue the conversation with your companies, with your local communities, with your home, <laughs> with yourself. How do we keep this growing? How do we become the example for tech? And we're doing a good job with 23% registrations this year were people identifying as women. So that's pretty good. It's up from the usual 20% for most of our sessions, or most of our conferences in the past. So we're going up. And if you look around, and I've been looking around the last couple of days, definitely more women than I when, uh, saw when I first started doing these cons. So that's, I think that's huge. And last night, those of you who got to make it to the Women in Drupal event, it was extreme success. It was fantastic. I think people got to meet new, make new friends. My coworker told me she got to meet lots of new, make new friends and make new connections. And so we know we're not alone, that there actually are other women doing this. We're not, we're not islands. And that feels a little safer. Um, also, what does it mean to be a good developer citizen? How do we can encourage this? Um, so I went to a talk recently, another talk meetup, um, by a gal, Elaine Marino, and she does different ways of um, diversity stuff. And she gave some pretty neat quotes, and I refer to this later on in the references. We added some references at the end of these slides, and they will be available. Um, from the Hardness, Harvard Business Review, a 2016 study, well, published in January, so it was obviously done before 2016. They did a study of 24 top CEOs regarding why they think diversity is important. Um, and they believe, they, the CEOs, believe that diversity was a business imperative because their companies needed it to stay competitive. And they believed it was a moral imperative because of their personal experience and values, diversity. And um, Paul Block, CEO of Marisant, also said, people with different lifestyles and different backgrounds challenge each other more. Diversity creates dissent, and you need that. Without it, you're not going into the, to any deep inquiry or breakthroughs. And that's true. You get a room full of 20-year-old programming white males, they're only going to have one view of the world. Uh, there's a few other views in the world. So how do we encourage that? So a couple of vocabulary, a quick vocabulary lesson as to things we'll be talking about during this talk. Um, diversity, equality, inclusion, and marginalized group. And so diversity, in broad terms, diversity is any dimension that can be used to differentiate groups and people from one another. It means respect for and appreciation of differences in ethnicity, gender, age, national origin, disability, sexual orientation, education, and religion. And it, this one, so, I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> Equality, everyone's having an equal access to the same opportunities despite any of those situations, regardless of. Inclusion, inclusion, the state of being valued, respected, and supported. We all want to feel included. You go into a shop and you're 
the only woman or the only person of color or the only transgender. You want to feel like you're included and no one's looking at you going, oh, well, they're different, so I don't really want to include them. And it's more than just getting them to join in, right? And any uh, marginalized groups, anyone who appears to be different from the norm or baseline. We all dealt, dealt with this in school, right? We were all the different kids in school because we were smarter or different, talked different, had different aspirations. So we've all been there. Um, you can be one, in one marginalized group and not in another one. For instance, a white gay, gay ma male. Uh, the white male, you're definitely not marginalized, but the gay male, you may be. And we don't want that to be. Let's not be. And some fun numbers. So <laughs> I particularly like the, the second slide over there. Diversity is n not found here, right? So these major tech companies and clearly missing some diversity, uh, race-wise and gender-wise. So they, we've got a lot of work to do. I think this, these are both 2014 studies. The first one is 2014, the year Silicon Valley sp spilled its diversity data. So an interesting piece of, um, an interesting fact is eat, every month the tech industry adds about 9,600 jobs um, in the U.S. So this is just talking the U.S. at this point. Um, by 2018, we're talking another 1.2 million jobs, boasting an average salary of about 78,000. We're all hoping for more, obviously especially like 2018. Um, so women make up about 28% of this, these numbers in the computing workforce, but in the world, in the US workforce, we're, we make up 53% of the overall. So there's a little differentiation there. And how do we, we need to figure out how to equalize that. And Latino and African American workers are making, each making up less than 5%. So we got a lot of work with people of color. Um, And I wonder, one example of that, and this is, has horrified me. I was working for this couple, not for much longer after this happened, but we had a man of color come in and he was building these, it was a hardware company at the time, it was a long time ago, building these awesome, awesome computers. And he had some connections in the hardware field, so he was getting these really cool components for really cheap, so we were able to sell these, build these really cool compu computers. And they wouldn't hire him, and this is in Southern California, which I always thought, pretty diverse. They wouldn't hire him because he was of color, and I was just horrified. And they said, well, our clients wouldn't want to buy them if they knew he built them. And I was like, wait, wait, what? What century am I living in? I really, I was so upset. <clears throat> so when you're marketing your company, make sure you're watching how you market your company. Make sure your pictures show women not just helping out or looking like the secretary at the front of the, the office. Have her showing code, have her writing code, have her drawing out um, diagrams of the images or have them on the screen. You, you, you get the tech pictures and the gal looks like she's really the secretary that came over and helped the guys. And she's all just fancy in there in their shorts and t-shirts. And Let's make it equal, you know, we, these pictures just aren't equality and, and make sure when you're putting out Facebook, it's not showing your image on Twitter and Instagram and marketing materials. Make sure, double check your stuff. When you're looking at the stock, for, the stock photos that you're grabbing to advertise your company or show this great event we had, make sure there's women in the picture doing, drinking their wine or drinking their sodas, not just the boys in their beer playing ping pong. It's, if they're there, include them. Make sure they show up physically. <laughs> not just metaphorically. Um, the work environment. Is your work environment open to diversity? Think about this when you go into your shop. Uh, is it all pool and ping pong? Is that what you see first? Are you seeing really cool computers? Are you seeing people at desks that some women, they put the flowers on the desk and the pictures of their children. Is that okay? I have been in offices where they've told me, put away the pictures of your children. I'm like, because that's my world right there. So my kids come with me wherever I go. And I'm going to have my box of pretty tissues because I have to have tissues because somehow if I don't, my nose will run. It's just, you know, typical. Um, beer and kegs, great. I have no problem working in a company with beer and kegs. 
but sometimes I want a glass of wine, or I might want just a soda, well, I don't drink soda, but I might want soda. And there should be a variety of drinks that make everybody feel included. Skateboards on the wall. Nikki works at a place that skateboards on the wall. Okay, one or two skateboards maybe, but are you a bunch of teenage boys? Are you gonna grab them down and go play? We talked to a friend yesterday and he was saying, hey, how about everybody in your company gets to bring something that means something to them? And that shows everybody's personality, not just the boss's personality. Now everybody feels included in the decor and they feel more invested in the company and feel comfortable. It's like, there's my pictures of my bulldog or my two crazy puppies. I would love to have pictures of them. And my kid, and something my kid, some silly piece of clay that my kid molded into something that he thinks looks like an ashtray, even though mom doesn't smoke, you know, those <laughs> things. So think about your office environment. Is it cool or is it exclusionary? Does it make people feel uncomfortable? Because they're like, well, I don't really skateboard and I don't play ping pong, so am I going to feel stupid if I don't take my boss's challenge every day to play a ping pong game? I don't want to lose and, so, and I suck at ping pong, so I'm not going to play the game. And then I feel like maybe I'm not included because I'm not playing the game. So these are things to think about. Um, one quote, a uh, female senior step four engineer, I did not write this, but it very well could have come from me. So she's trying to find the right culture of a shop to work on. She wants to write on code. And she's a mother of two. In my case, it'd be a single mother of one, but I could say this too. I say, I don't care about the beer and ping pong. I'm not there. I'm going to be there. I'm going to work. I'm gonna, I work done and up 4.30, 5 o'clock, whenever the end of the day is. I'm going home because I've got things to do. I'm going to play ping pong with my son. And neither one of us can play, so I feel like I can actually compete. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there drawers for women? Uh, if you've got those cool stand-up desks, that's great. But is there a place for us to put our feminine supplies. We don't want to stick them on the table. You get, the men are going to feel awkward and then I've made you feel bad. But I need, play, I need to have a storage of those with me at work because accidents happen and I need to have, be able to grab what I need at a moment's notice. And my snacks. I like my <coughs> snacks. I like my healthy snacks, but I'm not really necessarily going to share with everybody. And everybody, somebody might have medication they need to have and they don't want to stick that on the table. And they don't want to have to have, haul around a purse, but they like to have a supply at work for whatever reason. Um, and make sure, again, make sure your shop doesn't scream bro shop. So gender pro pronouns, um, something to think about. And this is actually something I learned doing this because I didn't know such a thing existed. But I've been schooled. <laughs> um, some people have, who've transgender have decided, or I suppose even straight could choose their own and I say suppose because I haven't met anyone who has gender pronouns they want to be called. Never call somebody a his or what did I say, he, she, or an it, because nobody wants to be that. That's horrible. But ask somebody if you don't know, how would you like me to refer to you? <coughs> Here's <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> some examples. They, them, theirs, as in the singular, singular, they got their glass of water and sat down. My coworker tells me she, she'd rather be called she because she doesn't want to introduce all new pronouns and confuse people, which is fair, absolutely. Z in here, and I'm going to read this because I'm still learning this one. So as in, case, in the case example here, Zena ate here food because Z was hungry. Z replacing he, she, and they. Here replacing her, hers, him, his, they, and theirs. And these are just examples. There's a ton more I saw big graphs, I'm not going to go through them all. Or just using someone's name. Joe, oops, sorry. Joe wants to eat Joe's sandwich alone, whatever. Be mindful of those. And when you're doing your meetups, what can we do to make those more diverse? What, why, if, if I have 50% of my community, there's only three women showing up. Why aren't they? There are probably just as many women out there are curious to learn, but they can't make it to the meetups. Why? Maybe they've got kids at home they've got to take care of. And consider this too, it could be a married gay couple and both of them need to go take care of the kids. Neither one of them can get there after work because we're all tired and we want to go home, we've got to take the kids and sit on the couch. I'm tired, I don't want to do this anymore today. So maybe Saturday mornings meetups once a month or once, every, once a quarter. Figure out a different time, figure out something else to include people, maybe childcare. Every, there's always teenagers in every community and they're always looking to make a buck. So maybe invite a couple of teenagers and have a room they can hang out with the kiddos. 
we should be careful with licensing and everything else, but you know, these are just some thoughts. Um, drinking, is only beer available? Maybe there's people who are coming who don't drink beer and they feel, they feel left out because there aren't other alternatives and they feel like, well, this is just really, it's just an excuse to get together and drink beer. I don't drink beer, so I'm not gonna go to the meetups. And they may be missing great opportunities to make connections. Um, so some ways to impact your micro communities. Um, some of these also work for work environments, but you could put it to a bigger location thing, a bigger community. So setting quota, quota, quotas, sorry. Not forever, because we know that quotas forever don't really fix the problem. But if you're trying to go from like 1% diverse to 5% diverse community, work environment, office space, whatever, Set a quota, by the end of 2018, we wanna have 5% women managers or women developers on the team. So now your goal, you're gonna be set to that goal. Children, if we're gonna be teaching our children, make sure that if you're gonna do an invite, you only allow five boys if you get five girls and then you can up the thing to try to keep the numbers um, equal. So when the little girl who wants to be a programmer shows up, she's not the only little girl and she's like, well, Last time there was no other little girls and I felt kind of silly, so I'm not gonna go this time on. Make sure there's other people. Make sure there's at least th equal or close to equal amounts of both. Mentor programs. Set up a mentoring program um, in your meetups or in your community. And set specific goals, not just like, hey, call me if you need me. It's like, hey, let's get this project together. In two weeks, I'm gonna check up with you. Act like it's any kind of project. Set goals and meetings and by the end of this, I expect this much, and if you have problems in between, call me, but if not, I'm gonna, we're gonna check up in two weeks. Everybody works better with some kind of goal. We all know that if you don't have a, if the school says just turn it in whenever, two days before the end of the semester, you're gonna turn it all in. It never works for any of us. Um, so check it like another project. It could be another Agile project. project. If you wanna test your Agile experience but you haven't, aren't ready to bring it into the office, grab a mentoree, and there you go, test it on them. Um, another thing to think about is make your job descriptions when looking for employees very specific, not just somebody who manages uh, websites before or just Drupal websites. Like, I want Drupal 8 and we need to have six months of experience, da 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 da. And gals, and this is something we all do really bad, I don't think men know that we do this necessarily. We make sure we've checked every single box. I can tell you what, the boys aren't doing this. <laughs> So if you think you have some of them, give it a try. Put yourself out there, give it a try. And that's pretty much what I've got. And I will turn it over to Miss Nikki. Hi. Um, I have another quote. I'm a big fan of quotes. Um, Edmund Burke lived a long time ago. So this original quote said, nobody makes a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he who could only do a little. So I updated the gender pronouns so that it includes all of us. Um, I think what, for me at least when I hear stats about um, women in tech on a community level or on an industry level or on a countrywide level, it feels really overwhelming. And it feels like, well, I'm just a person. Like I can't, I can't change the number of women who are entering STEM programs in college. I can't change um, the experiences that people are having at, organiz at Fortune 500 companies. Like I, there's all these things that I can't do. Um, and it, you kind of feel just powerless. I can't change you know, racism in any community. But what I can do is change the way that I interact with the people around me and hope that the people around me will change the way that they interact with the people around them. So for me, when I think about diversity inclusion and inclusion, um, I think about things that we can do starting right now. Like we can all leave this room today and be better allies and be more welcoming to every single person that we interact with for the rest of the conference and we can take that attitude straight home with us. Um, and hope that the ripple effect uh, or the butterfly effect or whatever magical effect you want to call it um, actually happens. Um, so when I first gave this talk, it was to a room full of developers and I came up with a list of things that make you a good developer. And then I started thinking, well, no, this is a list of things that make you a good tech worker in general. Um, and then I was like, well, actually, this is a list of things that make you a decent human being. Um, so I've kind of, so we're gonna go through this list um, and talk about how it applies to our interactions um, and a little bit how it applies to our work in technology also since we're at a tech conference. Um, but, but for each of these, 
to think about the ways that it can make us a better ally um, and the ways that we all do it, um, it correctly and incorrectly. Um, and just to put this out there, nothing that we're about to talk about is saying you're a bad person or you should feel guilty for being a white guy or you should feel guilty for being able-bodied or you should feel guilty for having all this privilege that you were born with. None of this is about that. This is about saying, okay, how can I just be better to the people that are around me? Um, so the first one is listening. How many of you have had this conversation at a tech conference? I'm get, I see one hand, but I'm guessing it's everybody in here. <laughs> right, it's, it's everybody, right? Um, we've all said to someone, yo, I can't get on the Wi-Fi, and they're like, I'm on it, whatevs. Um, and this is, I think, the perfect example of denying someone's lived experience. And we hear the phrase lived experience all the time if you, read, if you do di um, diversity or um, any kind of reading in that. Um, we do it to each other all day long. We are constantly denying each other's lived experience from something as small as, well, the Wi-Fi works for me, so you must be doing something wrong, to, oh, well, we went on the same interview. They really liked me. They didn't like you? To, oh, I thought that conference was super welcoming. I felt so at home. Did you not feel welcome? Why, they, must, they were nice. It must be something wrong with you. Um, and we do it to each other constantly. It doesn't make us bad people. It's just something that we have been acculturated to do, and it's something that we can absolutely unlearn to do. Um, and I think this is absolutely foundational to being a good ally to each other. Um, is when someone's saying, I had a hard time, this makes me uncomfortable, I don't feel welcome here, I've, this, this is not accessible to me because of my different set of abilities, honor that. Like, how are you gonna, um, when you, for me, when I think about it logically, like, who am I to say that that made you feel uncomfortable or didn't, right? And, and the only thing you need to do is just listen to yourself when you interact with people. Um, and it takes practice. And we're all going to deny people's experiences all the time. Um, it's just going to keep happening. But what we can do is make a conscious effort to not do it. Um, and just as a side note, as I don't know how many of you are developers, but as a developer, my first inclination is to fix someone's problem. And so when they're telling me, oh, I have a problem with this, I'm like, oh, I'll, fi I'll fix it, I'll fix it. Rather than maybe what they just need is for me to acknowledge the problem and empathize with them and be like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I, I feel bad or I, you know, I, I'm with you in this problem. Um, so, uh, this is a bear looking very serious for any of you who can't see the meme. Uh, my part of the talk is all memes, just by the way. So, um, something else that I think we can all do is we can all make a decision within ourselves that we're going to be someone who stands up for diversity and inclusion. Um, and it's a really simple statement to make to yourself but it will absolutely color the rest of your interactions. So I think there are a lot of things that we know we should do, but we don't do for whatever reason. Um, an example I, I like to use is recycling. I think everyone agrees that we should all recycle. I think most people would recycle if they had two options in front of them. They would say, oh, I'm going to put this in the recycling bin. Um, but if the recycling bin was way down the street, would you probably just throw it in the trash can? Yeah, probably, right? If you said to yourself, I'm a person who is always going to recycle 100% of the time, no matter how inconvenient it is for me, then when you were standing there and you saw the recycling bin down at the corner, you, would, you wouldn't even think about it, right? You would just go and say, oh, well, I'm a person who does this. So I'm going to walk and I'm going to do this thing that I believe to be correct. Um, and I think that this is something that we can apply in this context. Okay, I am a person who when I see something that I believe is unfair or unjust or inappropriate, I'm going to stand up. Um, because when you're in that moment, and I think everyone's been there, whether it's about something as important as diversity or just something kind of light, you're in that moment where someone makes a joke and you're like, uh, um, I'm just not going to say anything. I'm just going to back away. I'm, I'm really uncomfortable. I don't want them to think I'm not cool. Um, or whatever, whatever you're feeling at that moment, right? I don't want them to think, like, I'm cool. I can, you know, I'll just, well, it's fine. Um, if you have already decided, I'm a person you can't use the word cunt in front of, for example. Then, when someone uses it, I already know. I already know that I'm this person, and I'll be like, hey, I've decided that this word is not acceptable around me. 
Um, and it takes that pressure off in the moment. And, and you start really small, right? You can start super small with um, that picture on the wall makes me uncomfortable. The way that you address that person who came in for the interview seemed a little strange to me. Can we talk about it? Um, and it's easy because we're humans and we make mistakes and balance is hard. It's easy to overshoot this and be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to start calling out everything. I'm, pra I'm practicing. And that's okay. Right? That's okay too. It's okay to come to one side and be that person who's hyper aware and then you'll settle into the balance that you find for yourself. Um, but something that I want to acknowledge is that this is a risky thing to do because we all have patterns of interactions with our coworkers and our friends and our loved ones and people in our lives. Um, and so making that change to be the person who suddenly you can't say that word in front of, everyone around you is going to be like, oh, you used to be cool with this. Um, and this comes back to honoring people's lived experiences. And if you're whoever you are and saying, okay, I'm going to start standing up for accessibility in my workplace. I'm going to take that risk and I'm, and as a person around that person, I want to honor the risk that they're taking and acknowledge that that's a big thing for them. And so, and a lot of this, really the underlying message of all of this is just empathy. Empathy and patience with each other um, and trying to be present. Um, and when you think about risk and technology, we all take risks all the time. And, and I think most of us are pretty comfortable with it. We all say, yeah, I'll do that big project. Yeah, I'll get it done by that date. Yeah, I'll, I'll present at that conference. I'll do that thing. Um, but when it comes to something much smaller, is saying like, yo, I didn't think that joke was cool. Suddenly, we're super risk averse. Um, and so just thinking about the way that you process risk and the way that you, have a, you tolerate risk in your life will help you figure out kind of just what you're comfortable is, what you're comfortable with. Um, this is a cartoon. One is the right answer and one is the wrong answer. Um, as developers, as technology workers, I think it's really tempting to say, oh, I've seen this problem before. It'll take me three hours to solve. And then you get into the problem and you're like, oops. Turns out this just looked like another problem that I've seen. I actually don't know how to fix that. Um, and this pattern, and as humans, we all just look for patterns. Seen that problem, seen that problem, seen that problem. Great, great. I know how to fix this problem. And so when we apply that kind of thinking to human beings, we mess up. And we make generalizations, and we make stereotypes, and we, again, don't honor people's lived experiences. And we say, oh, you're a person like this. You must have had this experience. This must have been like this for you. Um, and so this is just taking the things that we learn as engineering employees, engineering technology workers, and we've all learned to take a close look at a situation before we make an estimate or before we make a decision. And just applying that to people and situations. Um, so we're going to make mistakes. Whenever you're trying to do something new or do something better, you're going to absolutely mess up. Um, and because we want to leave time to talk, I condensed two slides into one. But um, the other slide was basically about, does anyone have someone they really super admire who is also a huge racist or a huge misogynist? Thank you for your honesty, right? Um, and you, it could be a celebrity, it can be, or you know, a famous individual. Um, oh, you know, I don't know if he was or not. Oh, Gandhi was so great, but there's some other stuff in his history. Um, I think I have a grandpa who was really great, but also a huge racist. Um, and so just thinking about, like, do you want to be that person in someone's life? Do you want to be that person who's like, yeah, Nikki's really great, but Jesus, she's a racist sometimes. Um, no, of, co like, of course not, right? That, that question was rhetorical. <laughs> so as we're trying to, to not be that person, as we're trying to learn from the people around us, we are absolutely going to make mistakes. Um, and part of it is slowing down and not getting defensive when those mistakes are called out and trying to just make a point to learn from them. Because for sure they're going to happen. Absolutely. When you're trying super hard and you're nervous or you're standing up for something you believe in the first time, um, you know, it's going to be a rocky path. So just acknowledging that that's going to happen and being kind of nice with yourself. Um, and on the topic of mistakes, there's, I'm a lesbian. <laughs> uh, just want to address 
a way that people commonly make mistakes, which is asking invasive questions or asking inappropriate questions or wanting to know and not knowing how to do it. Um, so I can, only speak for, I can only speak for my lived experience, which are some of the questions that I've gotten um, about my sexuality or about my personal life from people who are just curious um, and not trying to be offensive. Um, and I think now we have Google. We have I have books, we have libraries. There are so many ways to find out about the experiences of people who are different from you. Rather than making your first instinct being like, can you explain to me how this works? Right? Uh, you're laughing because you've probably experienced it also. Yeah. Um, and and this, so this is both ways. This is like, as someone who is different than the majority, wanting to respect that person's curiosity, assuming that it's respectful, and being like, okay, I know you just want to know, let me answer this for you. And also encouraging everyone who's curious to use Google first. Um, you're going to get a lot farther by saying, hey, I Googled. I Googled, I know you're from Nicaragua. I Googled something about Nicaraguan history. Can we talk about it? Rather than just being like, so you got rainforest there? Um, <laughs> And so part of this also is consistency. Um, and as you make the choice to be a person who stands up for diversity, and as you make a choice to be a person who honors people's lived experiences, knowing that you need to do that consistently. Because in order to gain, in order to build relationships with anyone, for any reason, you need to know that, you need to be a person that they can count on. And so, Again, going back to the recycling metaphor, right? If you recycle on Tuesday, but not on Wednesday, but again on Thursday, and then on Saturday, someone's like, you don't recycle. You're not allowed to be defensive about it because you're not, you haven't been consistent about it. And so it's about making a level, making a commitment at a level at which you're able to sustain and being aware of that commitment as time goes on. Um, and as we make mistakes, um, my, one of my favorite questions to ask is, how do you know if you've hurt someone's feelings? You ask them, um, and, and taking, and just being simple about it, right? Um, avoiding over-engineering, not making things more complicated than they need to be, and just being empathetic with each other. And being like, oh, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have asked you that question. I think I hurt your feelings, and I'm sorry, right? And just moving through that. Um, now we get to talk, all of us. I'm done. <laughs> so now it's your turn. Thank you. Um, and our slides will be up, um, but here are some more resources. Uh, one that I do want to point out before we all start talking is um, a developer named Fury. They wrote a um, an extension called Unbias Me that lets you remove identifying information from LinkedIn so that you don't see a person's name, gender, or profile picture when you're looking at their qualifications. Um, and there are more, more resources that I want to add, um, including this Top Women in Tech Twitter list, I found, I'd, I found a better one at one point and I couldn't find it this morning. Um, this list is a little skewed toward, towards white cisgender women, um, but we'll add some more when the slides go up. So. so the last one is the article that I was quoting. You can read yourself. There's a lot more in there than just what I said. And Bell Hooks, yeah. Always, everyone read Bell Hooks Absolutely. because she's wonderful. <laughs> That's awesome, thank you. You're at the mic. That's Hi. amazing. Uh, Ruby. Hi, Ruby. That's okay. Uh, my brain is about exploding with stuff about this topic, so. Um, yes, please. Well, I'm, I don't want to like take over everything or anything, but so I'm good. So I'm, I may spew a few different things too. You want me to sit down and shut up because it's getting kind of overwhelming. Um, so first of all, thanks so much for doing this session. It's a really important conversation. Um, I hope that we can. I, I'm really curious about other people. people 
people who don't speak English as their first language, mm -hmm. just, just off the top of my head, there's probably a lot of others, yep. right? Um, who, are, who have very interesting and important experiences with Drupal that we would, would all benefit to hear. Um, so I'd like to, in general, I'd like to just encourage people to, to um, think about being um, intersectional so that you don't mm -hmm. get caught up in just like, well, I'm just for women's rights, and you know, if you're a black woman, you can come with us, but we're, I'm just doing this women thing. But instead, think about how very, mm -hmm. very connected all of our issues are, and we really have to work together. And that really actually includes everybody, even white, cisgender, affluent men <laughs> can mm -hmm. be part of that intersectionality, because they grew up in a working class house or something. You know, like we all have stuff we can work on together. Um, so um, on the issue, so on some of the workplace stuff, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, so those were great suggestions, Karen. Um, I want to just like just throw out some more suggestions. Yeah. Um, one is to think about a lot of what you talk about sort of the, the organizational culture and whether it felt sort of welcoming for women, um, but also does it feel welcoming to people again who aren't white? Um, mm -hmm. Like, is everybody all going out to movie night? And, and is it always like something that not everybody would actually be interested in, um, or things like that? Um, but even more than lots of cultural issues, but even more than that, um, organizations should think about their policies and how they affect people. And we, we've all heard like those horror stories of, and fortunately I work mostly in, non, in nonprofit tech um, where it's slightly better, but we've all heard the horror stories of how developers are expected to work 60 to 80 hours a week, which means that basically only young, childless people can do that work. Um, and so moms especially get pushed out, but parents in general. Um, and family-friendly workplaces can benefit lots of people. So um, thinking about going beyond the culture, but actually the policies of the organization, like do you have paid sick days, do you have parental leave, um, do you have flexible work, do you allow people to work from home when they need to, stuff like that. Um, you can really do like infrastructural things to, to support um, having a more diverse workforce. Um, and on that note, yeah. um, Thank you so much for everything you're sharing. There, um, a new initiative just came out with a bunch of workplace policies. I think it's called FemPower, um, but I'll add it to the resource list also, where they literally are just giving you suggestions of policies for companies, one to 20 employees, 20 to 50, 100 plus, um, of things that you should and should not be doing to create inclusion across all, um, all margins. Same. Yeah, me yeah. too. Um, so we are having a box tomorrow from one to two. So if we run out of time here, let's let's get together and let's start putting together documents and trying to keep this conversation going. I, I certainly don't want this to stop at the end of this session. I want this to be a conversation, a living conversation. Yeah, and I'm also curious how people's experiences are in their local communities. Mm -hmm. um, DrupalCon, and this is neither good nor bad, is a huge organization. Uh, the DA is a huge organization with a lot of stuff going on, um, so sometimes it can be hard to make a change, but local communities are much more agile. Word. 
I personally have had very bad luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, straight up. Yeah. I've gotten a lot of feedback from people that is like, oh, we're pretty sure you hate white men. Um, and so now I start every conversation with, I don't hate white men. <laughs> Because I don't know what else to do, right? There's no other word for cisgender. There's no other phrase for white man. Th these are the only words that we have. Um, and, they're, and they're not good or bad, right? You're not bad for being a cisgendered white man. You're not, it's fine. Um, but so I am still searching for that vocabulary. If anyone else has any success with that, I would absolutely love to hear it also. So let, let me start with a possible answer to that. Oh, um, I thought it was. It was a minute ago. It was a minute ago. We got time. Is, I really liked what you had to say um, about uh, not devaluing people's lived experiences. Obviously, as a, I'll also agree, that's not obvious. As a developer, I also have a sort of reaction to if somebody says, hey, Wi Fi isn't working or something. And my immediate thought is, oh, I will add another data point to this so that you can get to the bottom of it. So I was sitting here. Mm. And I can say, I, as you said, like I'm sorry to hear that. Hopefully, we can make this better. In this particular instance, it worked for me. How can we make it work for more people next time, or something like that? Yeah, I hear you. And I think um, what also might be helpful is even just moving away from the paradigm of comparing experiences at all, um, and just letting people say. You know, because I, I hear your developer voice thinking like, oh, you, oh, me, me too, meh, meh. Uh, and just saying like, oh, you had a bad experience, that's, that's hard, I'm sorry. And the conversation can just stop there. Rather than trying to accumulate another data point or dive deeper, it can just be like, I'm sorry, it sucks to feel left out. And that's, and then you leave the focus on the person talking um, and you, because they're, they're what we're talking about, right? We, we want to empathize with them. Thank you. There was an earlier Google Hangouts. That's right. There was an earlier Google Hangouts. I forget which one. Um, but it was, they called it like Google Gangers. <laughs> you know, like in this sort of mini me kind of mm -hmm. sense that it was activity. I think that it may not have been the whole breadth of the conference that there was actual child care, but I think that for like a small portion, I think there were more extracurricular activities. It was for like families, it wasn't actually childcare, it was like you could bring your partner and the partner could go tour the city while, and your partner and your partner's kids or whatever while you did the conference. It wasn't childcare. I know I tried to set it up in Denver and it was really hard to find like a company that would do it for us. Like even it, because to bring it into the conference, the convention center, they were like, well, you have to get licenses and did it, so we won't allow you to do it here. But there is a nursing room. I'm like, well, that's not what I'm looking for because some people like single mom, I would have loved to brought my kid, but I couldn't. Oh, I couldn't. But if I could, I would have loved to brought him. And what do I do with him during the day? So I can't. Um, so we have looked at that in places. It's just it depends on the venue. And but now they've got more ch like drop-in childcare places. They could do more of that. So like that. 
That's awesome. Yeah. So um, I'm going to be really unpopular here uh, by saying something, uh, but I'm going to say it because um, I want to stand up for what I believe in. I come from Denmark. Uh, Denmark has one of the better ratios when it comes to some of these issues. First thing is we don't really talk about race. Uh, we talk about male, female, but we don't really talk about race. Uh, and that's not because we don't have issues with race, because the issues are so much smaller comparative to the male and female. We don't have either a uh, pay equity thing that's really small in Denmark. So we have a lot of things that are good, that, that are good on that part. But when I hear you talking about females and technology or diversity in technology, what I think of when I am sitting in a situation where I have to recruit for a company that I'm working for is I need the best qualified person. in our uh, high schools 
means that when I'm looking at a resume, I look at basically how many years have they spent in the industry and what kind of education do they actually have. And then when they come in for a, an interview, I, sub I, I usually subject them to something in technical to have to figure out can they actually do something. And I'll admit that I have never actually hired a woman developer. I have probably hired Yeah, you first. Yeah, the first thing we, I, will, I like to see personally is are your ads. I think a lot, especially like I say, people are studying for them about like verbiage, usage, and the wording of ads and how that turns out. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's what I was saying earlier, that women, when we tend to apply, we'll look at a, a job description and be like, oh my God, I can't do all this. I only know this. And so we won't even apply. We literally won't apply. Where men are like, I can only do a quarter of that. I could totally handle the rest of this. And they drop by. And I would extend that to marginalized groups in general, yeah. not just women. And I, I can only speak for women because I only am a woman. <laughs> but, but I'm assuming it's for the men. There's a, there's a two-way street here because I think women also need to realize that it's okay to not know everything. That's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's why we don't know that. Time on those candidates and identify the one who maybe has just as much um, uh, talent to them in terms of the mentoring or the opportunity. Right. So I have two things I want to say. First, um, when you think about qualifications, you might be looking at that in a kind of narrow way. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have, have already shared good examples of how having a more diverse team benefits the organization in lots of ways. Like getting different perspectives, understanding different kinds of users and things like that. So for, so for one thing, you know, years of years in the industry might not speak to some of those other important qualifications. That is right. So, so first of all, prioritize those other things. And if it's important to your organization to have that kind, to you know, to have more of that kind of diversity, because I think for most cases it is actually, um, then you actually need to prioritize it um, so that you look at um, again, you know, different understanding that people have had different things that led them up to it. I mean. You know, I've, I've been programming since I was 10 years old, but nobody ever suggested I should be a developer or a professional programmer in my life in, in over three decades. Um, so, you know, if, if you want to change the situation and you think it would help your organization, you should do some of that work. You have to reach out, pull some people in. You should set up mentoring. Um, this is something that helps all, all across the board for junior developers of any kind. Yeah. Mentoring can be very, very useful. Also, though, like if I was a woman and I was applying to work at your organization and I looked at the about page and saw there were no women in here, I wouldn't want to work there. So another that's another reason that you can't just expect people to well, you know, if they want to work here, they can apply. You know, like you really have to if you decide it's a priority for you, you have to go out and proactively work to change the situation. And then we're back to the quota system, which I honestly detest. Uh, guy in the green yeah. shirt in the back. You've had yeah. your hand up for a while. Uh, 
it's a way to get you there. We only have one more minute. Sam so Boyer. Sam. Turns into a notion of are they better qualified? 